to a working session. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know how you want to drive. Yeah, what would you do? What would what would be the general thing? Just to say. That you say, maybe set up a side meeting in the meantime and say announce it. Okay. On the netcon mailing list, we have a side meeting to discuss. Anyway, we should get started. It's nine thirty. Right. Good morning. All right, uh, this is the NetCon working group meeting for ITF-118. Um, oh, yes. Yes. You all should be uh, familiar with the note well. Uh, if you're not, as a participant, remember, you agree to follow the ITF processes and policies by participating in this meeting. Um, and if you want more details, there are some BCPs that we list down there at the bottom for you to go through. We also have a code of conduct. Um, we rely, of course, on your cooperation and encourage diversity and discussion. And of course, mutual respect for everyone in that is attending this meeting. We hope not to have to intervene, but we will if need be. Um, meet Echo. Um, I guess uh, I hope you have, by now you have had some interface with the sorry, uh, some exposure to the new interface of Meet Echo. Uh, we are also trying to get used to it, um, but uh, hope there are no major issues with that. Um, there is, of course, the remote and on-site tool. Uh, so choose whichever one works for you. There is, of course, the chat window for comments. Uh, and by the way, you can make it a separate window if need be. And there is also a Zulip link if you just want to, if you prefer to just use Zulip. Uh, we have a two hour slot um, and the agenda is fairly full, but we still have some time at the end uh, for any other additional items. The queue management by now should be fairly familiar to all of you. Uh, it'll be managed by Meet Echo, so please uh, raise your hand in Meet Echo before you speak um, on the microphone or remotely. And do remember to remove yourself from the queue once you're done. There is a notes page um, on the Meet Echo tool. We highly encourage folks to contribute to the notes and the minutes of the meeting. Uh, better, uh, more people that contribute, the better the notes come out to be at the end. On the status of the drafts, uh, the HTTPS node of draft has been in uh, IESG for some time. It was, uh, it had some issues with INI considerations that we have finally worked through. Uh, thanks, Rob, for that. We do have some remaining comments and dis uh, discusses that we need to kind of work through, which we'll do probably after this meeting. Um, the client server suite of drafts, uh, we're working through the 80 reviews on them. Uh, as part of, there are nine drafts, but we hope to at least push out three of them oh, soon enough. I'll let Ken comment on that. And we do have a broadband liaison statement to talk about. Right. Yeah, I was about to mention there was a liaison request that came in from BBF on the uh, client server suite drafts. More than just the three, the first three that we discussed. They also want TCP and TLS, I think. So uh, we'll prioritize all those and maybe uh, we'll try to get those through first. Now, I guess we need uh, to compose a response to that liaison statement. Okay. And uh, but we'll work with AD. We'll work uh, with Rob on the response. Send it to the working group for confirmation, and then send it on. Uh, yes, I think so. Because I think uh, if I remember correctly, it was asking about maturity, stability of the draft. So uh, I think the ones that we're about to get out the door, we can say these ones are where they are. Um, 
I don't think I don't think we can necessarily say that much about how stable they are because you don't know with the ICU reviews. We can warn them and things and say this is where they are in the process. Well, actually, actually, I think they're quite stable. Yeah, because I've... they've been deployed in production environments that I'm aware of uh, in two different uh, applications that I'm aware of. So what I was trying to say is you don't know what the comp's going to come back to the ICG review or, or ITF last call. So that's the thing we can't guarantee. Okay. But I think otherwise, I agree. Um, I think at the working group stage, they're they're done. I think pretty much. So. Okay. All right, uh, the TLS 1.3 draft has been submitted to uh, IC for review. I don't think so, we need a presentation for it here. The UDP NODIP draft uh, is working progress, uh, will be presented in this meeting. The same is true for distributed NODIP, transaction ID, list pagination, and the newly minted and adopted private candidate draft. And finally, uh, the versioning in Yang notification is also work in progress, will be discussed at this meeting. So here's the agenda for, the, for today. Um, we have a whole list of chartered items that we need to get through. And then, because we also have a few contributions in terms of non chartered items, including um, a paper, I guess that we'll discuss uh, at the end. So in terms of agenda, anything else anyone wants to talk about? Our secretary, uh, Per, had uh, thought to present uh, Yang, sorry, not Yangers, but RestConf Next and, and, and the NetConf Next, just to resurface those discussions, topics for uh, interest. So I think at the very end, there'll be some discussion about that and perhaps a, a get together later this week. All right, if there are no other comments or questions, we can move to the first item on the agenda, which is private candidate. Good morning, this is an update on the private candidates draft and I'm delighted to have my co-author James also here in the meeting. Next slide, please. Brilliant. Just as a very brief recap of the problem that the draft is trying to solve. So it addresses issues around the existing uh, shared candidate data store. For example, when you have multiple sessions making changes to that single shared candidate, uh, and then one session commits, and that commits all of the changes by all, all of the sessions, and also different sessions where their changes overlap and tread on each other. The draft introduces a private candidate data store, which is tied to a particular NetConf session or to a particular RESTConf request. Uh, it defines what a conflict is and how an implementation resolves it. Uh, it provides a solution both for NMDA-aware implementations, but um, the authors also wanted to allow non-NMDA-aware implementations to opt in to this private candidate um, data store. The draft describes exist, uh, extensions to existing NetConf operations to describe how they work with the private candidate data store, and it also adds a new update operation. Since the last meeting, the draft has been adopted by the working group and James and I have subsequently published a new version of the draft that addresses uh, comments mainly from Ki Fang. Thank you, Ki Fang. In particular, we've removed the link between the private candidate and the candidate capability for NMDA aware implementations. So if your NMDA aware implementation supports the private candidate data store, you just advertise that capability and that's the end of it. For non-NMDA aware implementations, we still require that if you advertise private candidate, you also advertise candidate. The reason for that is in the non-NMDA case, the way that a client uh, accesses the private candidate data store is by treating it as if it was the candidate. Uh, we've also added an IANA section to, to request allocation of this private candidate capability. The draft is more explicit about the life cycle of a private candidate. 
in particular, a private candidate is created the first time you reference it, for example, the first time you do an edit config operation against the, the private candidate, and it lasts for the duration of the netconf session or for the duration of the restconf request. Uh, the draft also, um, I suppose, normalizes the locking behavior. So now when you do a lock operation against the private candidate, it just locks the private candidate. Um, this is not a useful operation because only your session can access the private candidate anyway, so there's no point in locking it, um, but there's also no reason to preclude it, and this behavior makes the private candidate data store behave like any other data store in the context of locking. The other uh, strand of thought um, for private candidates is the overlap with uh, transaction ID. Um, the authors have sort of considered this in some detail um, and our view is that if an implementation supports transaction ID then it would be it would be useful if the implementation could could use that that method of detecting changes to the data store to support the conflict detection and resolution me mechanism of private candidates um, but we didn't want an implementation to have to implement transaction ID in order to support private candidates. Um, that's the end of my updates, and I welcome any questions. All right, so I'll go first with um, the point that you just mentioned. So even though you kind of separated the transaction ID from private candidate, could that be a should or may or may for some for an implementation that is uh, implementing transaction ID? Could the conflict resolution be still be used? I think, I think, um, I think we would. Yes, we would like that to be the case. I think that m may require a bit more thought to make sure that that is the case. Um, we are planning on talking with Jan later in the week. Um, and uh, I will send an update to the list uh, about the outcome of those discussions. Okay, I'll go second. Kent as a contributor. Can you say some more about the RESTConf support and especially with regards to the destruction point? Yes. Um, fu fundamentally, um, uh, Fun fu fundamentally, in my opinion, um, private candidates are not particularly useful in the context of RESTConf because, um, because the data store only lasts for, for the duration of, the, of that RESTConf request. It's not, not sort of a long-lasting data store. Um, the main sort of behavioral change in the RESTConf context is currently with RESTConf, if the implementation advertises the candidate capability, then when you do a restconf commit, it will commit the, it will copy the candidate data store to the running configuration. So you still have the problem where if if other sessions like the net other netconf sessions have changed the candidate data store, then that restconf commit will also commit those changes. So the main behavioral change for restconf is that um, if an implementation supports private candidate, then a restconf uh, session can't commit other sessions changes. Okay, so I think I understand that RESTConf is actually not supported in terms of uh, having private candidate. I, 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 you're saying it's session-based, right, With for NetConf? So the NetConf session actually has to be destroyed, but, but even for NetConf clients, just because they do a commit doesn't mean they actually close their NetConf session. So we may want to rethink parts of this, I think. Um, so I actually, I don't, I don't follow your point. With the netconf, did you say that um, the private candidate gets created upon first edit config? Yes. And when does it get destroyed? And um, when the netconf session closes. That's what I thought I heard. Yeah. So, but uh, but netconf cl clients don't typically close their netconf sessions just because they do a commit. Yeah. That's a change in behavior. Uh, For many management systems, they will have long-lived netconf sessions that will last days or weeks. Yeah. And they're not going to disconnect just because they can, did a commit. And, and so why is that a problem? And what's the incompatibility? Then they won't be able to use this mechanism. If they 
require having long lived background sessions then yeah because you seem to get give given the impression that the risk con any edits that come in will conflict with anything that net concession is trying to do at that point well i'm saying two different things i, piv <laughs> I pivoted i started with rest conf but now i'm pivoting to net, net conf yeah. because you're saying that the commit for net conf happens when the net conf session closes and i'm suggesting or stating that for many management systems they don't close the net conf session um uh to to clarify it if a so a net conf session can can do a commit and that will commit the private candidate at that point in time mm -hmm. okay all right so then it's not really tied to the closing of the net concession right. right yeah i think you misstated earlier then i got confused sorry for the confusion uh but still there's an open issue i think with restconf uh the support for restconf i would like it but more if it would be possible to for restconf clients to also be able to have private candidate data source Uh, Rob, I think I just just to comment on this discussion. So, um, as a contributor, so I think the net conf one, I don't see why there's an issue there because it just means that your private candidate data store stays open for a longer period of time. So, I'm not sure why that would be a concern. I still don't understand your point. Uh, there was a misunderstanding. Oh, fine. Uh, but it actually isn't when the net conf session closes. After all, it's when the commit happens. Is the private candidate? Uh, oh, and then, and then you recreate a new one afterwards, do you? A new edit config would create a new private uh, candidate. It just, it just lives on. At the, at the point, can we James? pull up that diagram? I believe there was a diagram in the yeah, slide deck. Yep. So, James coming from Nokia um, uh, as a co author. So uh, the session remains open and the uh, candidate configuration, the private candidate configuration remains. Um, when you do a commit, uh, it is synced with the running configuration, but remains open. Um, so it doesn't get destroyed and recreated. Um, so it is a, a long-lived thing, um, yes. but it is continually updated. So it doesn't cause an issue with any management systems from that perspective. Um, so that's from a, from a NetConf perspective, that's the plan. And you can see in the diagram, uh, let's use the top one here, private candidate one. We make a bunch of edits. Um, we do a commit which does an implicit update or an explicit update behind the scenes. Um, and then that is basically your, you know, where you, where you currently live in the tree. Uh, and that remains until the session gets closed. Uh, the rest comp side is different, for sure. Absolutely. And then I think, um, you know, Rob was trying to um, articulate, I think that uh, it's it's maybe less uh, useful in the rest comp environment, given the, the short lived kind of, uh, activities that happen with each individual transaction. Um, but it was placed in, you know, as you know, from, from some feedback from the group. Um, so yeah, if you, if you could take a good look at the, the rest comp side of things and, and make sure that we, we have it correct um, and, and that it's still valuable, then that would be very useful for feedback. Thanks for the clarification. The net comp side looks brilliant. It's just the rest comp side. I'd like to see some ability for the support to be there as well. And, and just a quick comment on the refs comp side. I think the thing that's interesting is I think you can create the date store. You'd have to give it like a random name, probably or a random ID. Uh, and then is the, how would you stop anyone else from editing that same one coming in from another request and want to edit that same um, data store, I think is interesting. But I think it's an interesting problem. I also agree with Kent. It'd be nice to have a solution with rest comp that gave like, full private candidate beyond the single request. Well, it, it could be tied to the authenticated rest comp username. Okay, that makes sense. So Kent's got some good ideas here, I think. Yeah. Sorry, Jan, for jumping the queue on you. So go ahead. Uh, John Lim, Dodd, Cisco. Um, so I really value this private candidate initiative. I think that's a valuable functionality. I would definitely want to use that in our products. Uh, there are some... Um, aspects of this that I don't particularly think is well thought through yet. For example, when you have this many different modes and stuff, it's too many modes for an efficient implementation and interoperability. If, if you have six different modes and some servers would have to support all six and clients several, it, it becomes a testing matrix problem. So if we could reduce the number of modes, I think that would be a good thing. Uh, one of these modes is about uh, how you update things at uh, when things change in the in the rest of the world, you have this uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, auto update. Uh, auto update something mode, right? Uh, if you're a, if you're a server implementer, 
you always have to keep running in the database at all times, right? There's no way around that. You have to keep running, updated. Uh, private candidates can be implemented as either snapshots of the whole running or as uh, deltas towards running or something like that. So you have to keep track of what differences there are in running. And uh, if you're not using this auto update mode, then you have to do this. And uh, if, if your running is big, that becomes a scaling problem. So, and uh, if you have a single medium sized router, I don't think that's maybe a big problem, but if you have a much larger configuration to care about, uh, that's, that's a problem, a real problem. And uh, I would li really like this private candidate concept to work also in the large scale systems. So that's an important point for me. And there, uh, as we have discussed a little bit earlier, and we'll discuss more this later this week, there are some changes we can do to this to fix that, I think. And also as the author of the transaction ID draft, I think there's lots of functionality that uh, could be reused here, in my opinion, that would fit very well in here. But I understand also the sentiment that you don't want to force people to implement transaction ID. But so maybe we can, uh, at the core of this is the concept of what the conflict is. And I think if we can agree on what that is, we can even separate that into a separate draft that we both reference, both from the PrivCan or whatever. But I think we need to agree there so that we don't have to implement two different conflict resolution mechanisms for each draft. That would be a nightmare. Thank you, Jan. Just to address those points very quickly. Um, first of all, to clarify, sorry, in the draft, it's not referred to as auto update, it's referred to as continuous rebase yes, mode, just you. to clarify. Um, that was my mistake. Um, uh, yes, I agree. Uh, the, the, I, I certainly hear what you're saying about the having lots of different modes. I think it would be good if the working group looked at those modes and we could reach some consensus you know, about whether those can be reduced. Um, and I also note your comments about um, making this work in, in the large scale with respect to the, um, the update mode. Um, and uh, yes, it would, be, it would be nice if we could agree on a definition of a conflict so that that concept could be reused. And I will um, make sure I update the list with the outcome of any discussions later in the week. Excellent. Hi, it's, it's Chufa. Um, you mentioned that you have resolved address the comments I have raised during the adoption call in the latest version, but I don't think all of the, my comments has been resolved. For example, I raised a comment that you extend the NetConf operations to allow the private candidate to be accepted as a target data store. But, and you also uh, define a new RPC called update, but you don't have the young data module defining that. I think this is missed in the document. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. The document doesn't yet define the Yang data model. Um, that, that is something that the authors will work on. Yes. Thank you. We've locked the queue. Uh, James, I know you're in the queue, so you can still come. But uh, how far are you into your presentation? We... Uh, that's, that's it. Well, OK, great. And next steps? Address the comments in the room. And... Yeah, I think there's been been um, a lot of useful feedback here, and um, I uh, I think there'll be some discussion on the list uh, about this, which will feed into the next version of the draft for sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Okay. Transaction ID tricks. Thank you, John Lim. That's Cisco, and I want to talk about the transaction ID and the trace draft uh, all at once. Uh, it's now at version uh, 02. and what really happened since 01 is uh, one major thing. It's uh, we've implemented this transaction history concept that we discussed in the last IPF, uh, as was uh, most people in the room wanted. Thought that was an interesting idea, so let's let's do that. And I will, uh, most of what I will present here today is how that works. And uh, with that, uh, after this update, I don't have any more feedback that I'm aware of or, or ideas from anybody about what should go in here. So I think, uh, unless we hear from the audience here within the next, until the next IPF or so, uh, what needs to change or update, I will be asking the chairs for a last call or something. Sounds good. 
I also added uh, one more extension, Yang extension, so that uh, authors that have interest in implementing this can mark which nodes in the Yang tree that will have this uh, transaction ID uh, nodes uh, or attributes attached if, uh, as an optional feature. I need to do it. Oh, right. So here's how it works. If we have a client here that has now uh, information about what the configuration is on the server, and the server is, of course, it has its tree, uh, then you can do a get config and you get the whole tree. That's, that's how NetConf works, right? Uh, note, though, that this tree, of course, it can be the root or the entire tree, but it can also be a subtree somewhere deep under it, depending on somewhere. It does not need to be the whole config or even at the root of the tree. It can be anywhere. Slide. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what it, you're no, well, no, no, it, it works. It's a meet echo bug, I believe, because I'm on a different screen. I'm, yeah. I'm doing a show a handful and or preparing it. And apparently while I'm doing that, it won't allow you to increment the slides. So I'll increment it for you. There Thank you me. go. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, another, uh, the new thing here is that you can, in your uh, get config calls, uh, basically say, I want to want know what happened since a particular transaction ID. In this case, the green color represents a particular transaction ID. This uh, is the latest known transaction ID that the client has. And it's asking, sir, what happened since the green? The green happened. Yes, there's response, an empty response back. No, otherwise, in today, you would have to ask for all of it, get the whole thing there, and compare, and finally see, oh, there was actually nothing new here. So that's a, a significant savings in, if you're on the client side here, and even for the server to not send all this data down. It's a heavy operation to collect all this information and send it down just to see that it's not a change. Thanks, please. Okay, it works. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so there, here's now another case where the server has, uh, has seen the change. The yellow nodes are new, coming from, somebody, from some other manager or uh, operator maybe. So we do the same operation again, get config since green, and then we get back exactly these three nodes. With the pre previous versions of the transaction ID specification, you might have gotten a few extra nodes, like another green down here, because it was difficult to express exactly what you wanted. But now we have this transaction history concept, you can get exactly what has changed. And you see this down in the corner here, uh, reflecting what the server thinks is the transaction ID. It knows it was green uh, earlier, and the latest one is now yellow. And uh, of course, the server can implement this transaction history in different ways. If it chooses to use straight integers, monotonically increasing integers or something like that, the history is pretty simple because you can easily compare which integers are smaller and larger. So here's a more complicated case, and we have an edit config. The client says, I want to change these three nodes here, the, the uh, shadowed one up on the, on the top. So it, then it sends those three down, just as usual. But can it also say, if the latest one is yellow, so it's conditionally making this edit config. And since the server thinks that the latest transaction ID is yellow, it will go and implement that implement them, uh, give it back a new transaction ID blue, so that the client says, okay, uh, the nodes here are blue, and we'll mark those with that transaction ID down, down here. Uh, if the client is also using Yang push uh, and subscribing to changes at this part of the tree, it will get an echo. This is a normal thing today. Whenever you subscribe to things that you're changing yourself, you will get an update telling you what has changed. And then uh, uh, it's difficult for a client to know is this my echo, or did somebody else do something similar to what I did at about the same time? You don't know. You have to actually read it all, compare, and see, oh, this was my echo. But now, this is marked with a transaction ID. So we, the client can say, oh, this is my stuff. I don't need to care about it. Of course, still some waste, because the server generated a message that we don't want. But this is how subscriptions work, and we haven't changed that in this graph. At least we quickly realized that this data was not interesting. And here's the other case then. Uh, we are doing similar change. We want to change these three nodes, uh, sending them over to the server if latest is blue. But now, latest is not blue anymore. So uh, a change has happened by some other manager or operator in the meantime. 
So the, on the server side, the transaction ID is red. And in this case, uh, the server will just come back and say, no, can't do this. Your expectations of what the world looks like are not true. We reject it. And that's exactly what the client is hoping for. If somebody has been tampering with dealing with this, I want to know so I can re rethink what I want to happen on the network. So that's basically what this transaction ID mechanism is all about. There's, of course, a lot more details in the draft itself. But if you get this sort of level and think this is interesting, go read the draft. Uh, the little question marks here are supposed to be checkboxes. So we have some implementation experience of this. Uh, we have a prototype implementation of this mechanism, and it seems to work. Uh, we added this uh, transaction history concept. This is what this second line is trying to say. Uh, we, we added this Yang extension uh, so that you can mark in your Yang tree. This is one of these nodes that have a transaction ID associated with it. If you don't want know exactly what that means, go read the drafts and see the details. So these are the things that to, oh, they were on the to-do list in the last meeting, and they are done. Of course, we need further implementation experience, both in our own products and teams. But uh, I would value if anybody else would want to take a look at this. Now is a good time. And with that, we'll move over to the trace context. Uh, to uh, Jan, so before you, All right. uh, if, do you want to ask any questions on this particular part of the presentation for now? Thank you for a very nice draft. Uh, I sent a mail on the list a while back ago regarding the e-tags uh, together with RESTConf. So uh, the, the transaction ID uh, uh, tags are UTF-8 in this draft, and e-tag in HTTP is uh, US ASCII, I believe. So uh, that would be an incompatibility uh, that needs to be sorted out. Uh, because you also mentioned that you, uh, you recommend that different uh, APIs like RESTConf and NetConf should implement the same uh, transaction uh, ID. Um, and in, in HTTP, the E tags are per encoding so, uh, so that the matching works. Um, and, but you can select to have a strong uh, E tag or a weak one. So if you have a weak one, you can have the same, exactly the same identifier or uh, data in, in the e-tag across everything. But if you want to have a strong matching, you instead need to have a separate per encoding. Um, yes, I think that's a very good point. Uh, uh, you are quite right. We need to update the exact uh, format of these tags a little bit. It doesn't change the mechanics of anything, mm -hmm. but it's just to conform better to HTTP documents. Very good. Thank you. Uh, so we uh, had a quick poll that we wanted to conduct. Uh, so maybe. So if you could respond to that poll. You have to be logged into Meet Echo to be able to participate in the poll. Many no opinions. It seems like people need more time to read the draft and um, internalize it and, and respond on the list. Uh, last call will suss this out quickly, I think. No, no, I, I didn't want to ask for last call now, but I said for the next meeting, I will be discussing with you about last call. That's my yep. plan. Okay. At least I'm happy to see there's no, nobody really against. That's good. Uh, just a quick comment on the poll. Uh, I just note that often, actually, the other polls I've seen that's happened this week, again, there's been a large number of no opinions. So there might be tourists in the room who don't know, and hence in it. So don't now like to skew it too much, I think. Okay. That's one thought. Yes, yeah, so I think it's approaching last call. So if you want to read, now is something that's reasonably stable, I think, and it's a good time to give feedback. Or 
in a wider place. But please do read if you have anything to say about this. Can I just make, uh, sorry, one other comment on the actual, I haven't read the, the latest version of the draft, but the one thing I think would be good to get resolved or have discussion about is this overlap with transaction IDs and mm. the private candidate store. So it'd be nice to know if there should be any change of direction there uh, before last call. Is that a sensible thing just to have a discussion there? Okay, so I will move over to the quick to the next topic. Uh, just one minute here, uh, in the interest of time. We have a couple of other drafts. There's a transfer trace ID, and uh, they were adopted uh, before this meeting, uh, and there were no updates since last ICAP meeting in this. Um, and basically, what they do is they're taking some World Wide Web Consortium uh, HTTP headers or REST headers and mapping them in one case to netconf. So it's a very simple mapping, taking exactly the definitions from W3C, making them into XML attributes. And the second draft is saying, basically, take exactly what World Wide Consortium says and turn them into REST headers. That's all there is. It, this is uh, literally half page of text for each one. So we don't think there needs to be done anything else for this. We will just want these concepts from World Wide Consortium to fit into the REST conf and NetConf world. So for those last two drafts, uh, it seems time for do an adoption poll. They are adopted, I think. Oh, okay. Or, or at least Perfect. we, uh, I don't know if you have officially announced it, but uh, we have come far on that. Okay, very good. Uh, maybe we should talk a little bit more about error. No, we have, these are also checkboxes. We have talked about error handling. We have published them uh, as uh, should. Um, and now we need some implementation experience. And there's more W3C uh, related content that is related to this called baggage that we should be monitoring and maybe do similar drafts for. I think that's it for me. Okay, thank you. And in interest of time, we'll move on to the next presentation right away. Per. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Per Andersson, I'm um, from Cisco. Um, on behalf of the others, I'm, I'm going to present uh, the list recognition mechanisms for uh, NetConf and RESTConf. Uh, we're now at 02 uh, version of the draft. Yes, so um, and the overview is that uh, there's uh, one draft uh, uh, defining the uh, mechanisms, uh, filtering, etc., uh, for lists and leaf lists, and, and then one protocol draft each for NetConf and RESTConf. Uh, defining the, how it works for them. Uh, the current status is that uh, cursors, uh, cursor pagination that has been discussed before uh, is uh, finalized now in the draft. Uh, there's uh, snapshot support for uh, config false uh, added, so you can uh, indicate support uh, in total uh, per node and uh, in the system capabilities um, uh, model uh, or tree, and then uh, enable it per request. Um, uh, also added is local aware collating or sorting. Um, you can possibly now select which uh, uh, locale you want to use, uh, and then signal the server can signal back um, what uh, was used when collating. And then there's uh, some uh, editorials that has been made, uh, missing definitions and uh, things, clarifying error identities that have been discussed. Uh, and I also added this Yang security considerations <laughs> template text, which I don't know if it should be added or not, the Moriarty draft. So cursor-based uh, pagination then, uh, in the draft it's defined that a server should support uh, cursor-based pagination. You can, off -list, uh, you can offset a list then not only by uh, a number of uh, elements, but by a key. Uh, so this means it's only conformance list and not leaf list. And uh, currently, uh, it's augmented in the system capabilities tree that with the cursor supported leaf. So it's now uh, opt in, but perhaps it should be opt out. So this is what it would look like. You have a cursor, some base64 encoded thing, uh, and the limit of the elements. And then you get back this um, annotation with the previous and next. Uh, uh, cursors that you can uh, paginate from. Yeah. 
So I would like to poll uh, the room, if it's possible, if uh, cursor-based cognition should be opt-in or opt-out, if it's possible. Yeah. Otherwise, we can take it on list. Yeah, we can, we're... we can do the poll. So as an uh, individual contributor, I would uh, it's now defined as opt-out. But I would actually uh, suggest that it should be opt in because that would be nicer to have. And it's sort of expected if you work with databases. So, what uh, yeah, I don't know what yes or no means now, but. Uh, Sorry, we didn't redo it. So, right. we'll redo it. So you just make either of yes or no be opt in or opt out. Doesn't matter. Yes. It's a binary yes. choice. So yes is now that it should be opt in. Okay, I think we can continue this. Uh, we don't okay. need to. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, can, if someone just can note that uh, it, the room thought it was opt in because I'm not the first. Okay, cool. Yeah, cool. So, pagination with snapshots. It's defined now that the server may support snapshots. Uh, you augment uh, system capabilities with the snapshot leaf uh, to indicate support uh, for the targeted uh, config false list node. And you have the snapshot query parameter to uh, signal that you want to take a snapshot for this pagination. Uh, yeah, so you can enable snapshots per request. The allowed values are true and false, uh, both for lists and leaf lists. And uh, if the snapshots are not supported, you get back this uh, error uh, identity or the error app tag is populated with snapshot, snapshot not supported. Moving on to local aware sorting. Uh, server support uh, is must for config true lists, should for config false, and um, you may disable it for config false lists um, in, in the constrained uh, system capabilities then. So, um, reading my slides. Yes, so code points can be collated uh, differently depending on, on locale. I have extra slides if anyone wants this clarified. Uh, users can uh, select locale uh, for their uh, for their sorting, collecting, pagination, and be informed of what the server actually used, references to relevant documents. Yes, so the user can use this sort locale collate uh, query parameter uh, where the allowed values are is a freeform string, but should uh, be a language subtag defined in RFC 5646. Uh, if this is omitted, the server chooses locale. If it's on, if the lo supplied locale is unknown uh, or invalid, you get back uh, this unknown locale error. And the server signals in the metadata value in the response uh, what locale was used when sorting, if the node was not constrained. So this is what it will look like. You have the request here with sort locale collate that you send in for the Swedish locale get back a sorting uh, and then, or the collating, and then the, what the server actually used as a metadata value. Yes, some editorials, should we use this Yang security considerations template or not? Can take it on list or on review. So the next steps, fix these editorials, and then I think it's pretty much done. So we could go for a working group last call. Questions? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, well, uh, while we're waiting for Sean to step up. Um, Would you like to go ahead? Well, just very quickly, I just wanted to ask, that as chair, um, 
How many people have implemented this draft? Is, is anyone, has anyone implemented this draft yet? I assume you have. We, we have. Uh, yes, you have. Not of everything. But... And I've implemented uh, three-fifths of it, I think. Mm -hmm. Is anyone else implemented? I think there is one more that I've heard of that's implemented, but I don't know. OK. Netopier, or is that your implementation? Which one? Netopier. That's not mine. OK. So there's so a I, third I, one. I think, I think it's something that I know. OK. For sure. But still, that's pretty good for a draft that hasn't last called yet. So thank you. So I, I have got some confusion about the snapshot parameter. I think you have defined a snapshot parameter. But I don't really understand how would the client know whether to use that parameter or not. Or what's the difference between using that parameter or do not use that? Can you clarify a little bit more? Because so if the client sends in the, the, um, the to take a snapshot when you're paginating, you have to send it in. So then, yes. So but then the pagination would be. Uh, the retrieval will, the result will be returned based on that snapshot yes. result. Yeah, but how would the client know whether to use it or not? I mean, you, you would like to recommend the client to use it for some highly dynamically uh, changing. It, it's totally up to what the user expects. There is, however, I, I recognize now a missing point. How do you do with subsequent requests? Um, paginating this. OK, thank you. So that's missing, I think actually. Can I take it offline, I think? OK. I might be able to answer a little bit of that, which is I don't think snapshots are very useful for config true nodes, no. um, because you already have all the configuration. You can yeah. iterate over them yourself. So it's really just for config pulse. And I would imagine uh, it's probably highly dependent on the implementation of the database. Yeah, and also the application, I would guess. So what, what you uh, expect it to be, uh, I mean, the size of the data. The data, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, I am Alex uh, from Insalion, uh, presenting an update on the UDP native draft. So since the last ATF, we have uh, had a lively discussion on the mailing list. So we would like to thank George and Andy, Hans, Benoit, and Kent for this feedback. And so far in today, I, I would like to go through the different issues uh, I have listed. So let's go. Uh, so first, there were some concerns about the packet lost, given that UDP notice is based on UDP. Uh, there is an applicability section stating that UDP notice must be used when this is not a concern. For unchanged notifications, we would expect to use a reliable uh, transport, such as uh, HTTPS notice. And so far within this iteration, we have moved up only uh, the section stating that, uh, yeah, uh, that UDP not if it's uh, more for counters and things like that, that are not, uh, that for packet loss is not a concern, basically. Um, I don't know if we want to raise the questions during the issues or at the end uh, here as. I'll take them to you until it's not Okay. Yeah. Um, the second issue was regarding the segmentation implementation within the draft. Uh, the, there was a, the raised that the segmentation was uh, too similar to the IP fragmentation implementation, and therefore, why uh, do it at the UDP native level and not use the IP layer? Here we want uh, to, to state that we are using the UDP usage guidelines uh, in RFC 8085 that state that a UDP application should not use the uh, fragmentation. And that's why we uh, also uh, give that implementation at UDP native level. And also on 
a ha during a hackathon in 110, uh, some time ago now, uh, we also did some tests uh, in, in performance. And we noticed actually that when the packet was fragmented at IP level, and there is a big drop in performance in Linux. So that's why. And on this iteration, we have aligned totally to the RFC 8085. So we have uh, uh, put the mast into a shoot since uh, in the UDP usage guidelines, they, they state that it's, uh, it's recommended, but uh, not mandatory. Um, also, uh, we were raised that the version number, the definition of the version number of the protocol was not clear. For, so in this case, we have just predefined it. Uh, we have put also uh, the link to the IANA registry so that it is clear. And then uh, last, some editorial changes based on the, on the feedback. So the first one was regarding the message length. It, is, was, it was not clear within the draft that uh, when the message was segmented, segmented using uh, UDP not if, if this message length was for the entire message or only the UDP datagram. So we have clarified that. Um, and also aligning with the distributed not if draft uh, or using the observation domain ID. Uh, so this definition has been moved to uh, mess. So the identifier has been moved to message publisher ID. The goal of uh, observation domain ID was taking the definition from IPFIX, but we have noticed that uh, it raised more confusion than anything. So we have changed that name. And then some other editorial uh, changes on the DTLS section uh, based on the feedback from Hans. Uh, nothing big, uh, always stating that we are using DTLS, but not extending the DTLS uh, protocol to, to encode or to encrypt, to encrypt uh, UDP native messages. Um, so what's next? Uh, so far we have, we believe that we have solved all those issues, please, uh, if uh, you feel that uh, there is a still issues, raise uh, them on the mailing list or during the working group meeting. Um, we suggest to the chairs, up, up to you, to um, reach out to the transport area directory, directorate uh, for an early review. Uh, that might be uh, useful for, for um, clearing all of these concerns, maybe, but up to the chairs. And of course, uh, on the next iteration, on, um, we are planning to remove the generic uh, UDP client and UDP client groupings. Since uh, we've got interest from the working group that uh, it should be in a dedicated draft for usage in other protocol stacks. Um, this draft will be presented in, in later on. So. All right, uh, speaking as a contributor, so, um, oh, sorry, first as a chair, uh, we have sent a request to the transport services working group to get their feedback. We're still waiting for that. Um, to your, I think it was your first point, ah. which was about uh, the fact that you're now recommending uh, that the size be no more than, I guess, 64K. Yes. Like 1K. 1K, sorry. Um, which, which issue is was The okay. segment? Yeah, it comes into what? No, uh, the second point then. Um, yeah, so, MTU says. So, are you, so your, your recommendation is that it be. Uh, I, I mean, we, we, are, we are not uh, recommending any size of data. We are saying that uh, when there is a packet loss, when when there could be a packet loss within the network, UDP notif should not be used. And of course, within the configuration, you have also the MTU and you, you are able to set the parameters for segmenting on, based on, on your capacity of your network. Yeah, I think the should is probably a fairly strong indication that you don't want the implementation to exceed that size. Ideally, of course, uh, right? Um, but for sure, uh, you don't know whether the message is 
pretty big or pretty small, uh, and it's with young push, it is actually variable depending on, on, on the young module you are subscribing to. So we are only giving the mechanism to do it. Ideally, it should not uh, be used, but of course, uh, also using the guidelines of uh, UDP applications. RFC. Yeah, I think it would help to be clear that either you want to support it and um, that you highly recommend that everyone limit the size of the packet. Okay. So I adding a statement saying that uh, that uh, it should be supported, but ideally uh, the packet should be small. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Robertson, so um, going back to, I think, your first issue, the previous one to this, um, I don't have a concern so much about packet loss, but I think in when UDP is being used, often in ISG reviews, they want to see something about um, congestion control. So I think that's something that we discussed with, I discussed with the chairs and things like that. So I'm not sure what the answer is here. The answer might effectively be saying you should only deploy it in, in scenarios where congestion control is not an issue. Um, so that might be one solution. If it's, if it's coming up through a management network and you guarantee there's enough provisioning or the device that's receiving it, the, the uh, collector is very close by, it may not matter. But there definitely need to be some text here about congestion control. Whether that's sufficient, I don't know. There is actually a text. Uh, there is a subsection on the applicability section about congestion control. Okay, that already covers this. Yeah. So maybe that's sufficient. But um, hopefully the TSV review, when they... If it's gone to them, I'll definitely flag that and say, look, is this going to be good enough? Whether that even helps, I don't know. Okay, okay. and then Kant as a contributor. Um, I, you made a good point about how if it's just counters, it doesn't very much matter if you lose a packet yeah, or not. Exactly. Um, I think it's difficult for the applications to know how large the size of the messages will be because, as you say, Yang push is variable. But I also recall that in Yang push configuration, it is uh, on a per subscription basis. You can specify the transport that should be used. Yes. And I think that then it's possible that uh, you could say, well, give me notifications for everything that's not um, data plane, you know, high throughput data plane specific using HTTP notif, but then just for the data plane high throughput information, UDP notif. And so there maybe could be some guidance that could be had or put into the draft to rec make those recommendations, if that's possible. Uh, and then taking it one step further, maybe there's something in the configuration that could be said, um, only send over UDP if it's the size of the message is, is a certain size, you know, the, whatever my MTU for my network is, and otherwise use HTTP notif. Just like that, the last part is a suggestion, a recommendation. Um, I don't like the idea to uh, like, uh, choose the transport based on the size. I believe that it, it, it is up to the user to choose which transport, right? And, uh, and of course, it's always experience. Uh, so I don't like the idea personally uh, to add that. Um, having a statement that re it is recommended that when the packet is very big, use HTTPS notif. I don't have issue with that, but I wouldn't go that far. Uh, Agreed. Right. And in the interest of time, I think we'll move on. Are you done? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So subscription to distributed notifications. Oh, I was in a different tab. Try again. OK, sure. I gave you 10 minutes for both presentations. No worries. OK. So uh, from ITF uh, 117, we had one remaining uh, item, which is reviewing the observation domain ID terminology. We got some input from, uh, from Benoit that uh, the domain observation ID uh, we took from, uh, from IPFIX because it is very similar. And the problem it is, it is very similar, but not exactly the same. So that was uh, more uh, raising confusion than actually uh, helping. So we decided uh, in uh, 
this version that we are addressing this by changing the terminology to a message publisher ID. So we don't have any ambiguity uh, with IPFIX anymore. We hope uh, that addresses the concerns and requesting feedback fr uh, from the mailing list. And uh, other than that, we don't have any other remaining uh, uh, points. And uh, we believe it's ready for the last group last call uh, together with the UDP notice draft. Um, uh, Chair, the UDP Note of Draft, I think, currently depends on the new UDP Client Server Groupings Draft, mm -hmm. right? Which is not yet adopted. Exactly. So we could possibly progress this draft, but then it'd be stuck in a misref state uh, with the editor. Plan. I but. think we should uh, uh, discuss that when the draft is being uh, okay. presented and uh, to yeah. Okay. Any questions or comments? Good. Move to the next one. Good. Oh, yep. are you in oh. the window? No, I'm in the right. Oh, I had to go to the next slide. Sorry. Exactly. Support of versioning in Yang notification subscription. Just as a reminder, what is the, the scope of the draft? Uh, you see on the left-hand side, the, uh, the additions on the, the subscription uh, notifications. Uh, so we are adding the, basically the module name, the revision, and also the revision label. So that in the subscription state change notification message, uh, we understand for configured subscription, uh, what uh, module has been subscribed to and also what revision and uh, semantic revision uh, this module has. Uh, we got uh, two feedbacks from uh, the ITF 117 from Quifang and Rob. Uh, one is the, the error handling. So we extended the data store selection section now uh, describing the, uh, the new errors identities for uh, uh, revision unsupported, revision label unsupported, and incompatible revision and revision label. And in the operational sections, uh, that's the input from, uh, from Rob, uh, we gave some context towards the Yang package, uh, how it offers a complementary information by describing how one specific module revision is part of a set of uh, Yang modules. Requesting feedback, I hope it addresses uh, uh, your concern. And I like to state that in the afternoon uh, at 3.30 at uh, Palmovka 1 and 2, we have a side meeting regarding the uh, Yang to Kafka and message broker integration. Okay. Good. Yeah, I think. There is no comments. Any comments? Good. Yeah. Thomas, you're you're presenting this one as well, are you not? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking at That's so much better. <laughs> Good. Uh, one more to go. Support of host name and sequencing in uh, young notifications. So here, short recap, uh, what is about. So uh, currently the notification header uh, only has uh, the event time. So when the message is being published, we are adding now uh, two uh, three further items. One is the host name of the uh, exporting router. And also uh, we are adding the so-called message publisher ID. You just heard from the distributed notif draft I was presenting before and the, the sequence number. And the, the goal of uh, this draft is basically today, network operators, uh, when they are receiving young push messages from the network, 
uh, in order to, uh, to forward those me messages uh, to a time series database. Uh, they need at midpoint add actual, or at the data collection, they need to add this information uh, so that actually the, the end system is able to understand from which uh, uh, note this message is actually coming from. And that poses a problem that uh, we are changing now the semantics at midpoint. And uh, since now the, the semantics validation, especially when you do a, into a big data chain integration is relevant, we do not want that. So that's why we are putting that uh, at the point where the message is being ge generated at the, the young push publisher. So we introduced this draft at ITF 116. There was a poll which showed uh, much interest in the net working group. Uh, in this uh, 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 version, we uh, changed uh, the terminology uh, coming from the distributed notif draft uh, from domain observation ID to message publisher ID. And uh, currently there are no open points and uh, we are requesting uh, working group adoption. Yeah. Yeah, so I understand very well the need for this host identification somehow, but uh, how do you foresee the host would know how it is known? I mean, it's the, the clients of this information or the interpreters of this data somewhere far away in a chain may not look upon the host name the same way as the host itself or something. So, so that name that he wants to know on the other side needs to be transported back into... Uh, did you think about that, something? Right, so we try to be as close as possible to the other network telemetry protocols. So that's why yeah. we were using sys name. So if you look at the BMP RFC uh, in the initiation message, uh, there is sys name being defined and also it's actually not coming from uh, BMP itself. BMP is also relating yeah. to uh, SNMP, uh, where this is actually being coming from. So I believe we are very well aligned. And at the end, uh, uh, yeah, host name needs to be configured on the host. So we believe that the net network management system uh, should know that this, uh, this network node has, has this host name. Thank you. Sure. Um, so this, um, I might, uh, ask this question later on also, but I believe there are a combination of, uh, there's another draft that follows this, I think, which is about sys time. Is there any reason why we're splitting this into two separate drafts? Uh, because these are fairly small changes. Could they be combined uh, into a single draft? Uh, the reason why we sec separated the two is here we are extending the notification header uh, and the second draft is extending the young push header uh, with the domain obs uh, with the uh, with the timestamp when the matrix was being observed. So here in the notification header we have a timestamp which is defining when the message was being generated or sent, while the other one is observed. But I'm open here for sorry comments. So we're just doing a quick poll. Sure. There's uh, two more slides. Okay. We'll wait until after. Oh, there are. Okay. Right. There. And you got two more slides. Okay. Uh, oh no. Okay. Just, just back off. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. So I think it's largely <laughs> hasn't, uh, not many people have read it at this point. So maybe uh, let's continue the discussion on the mailing list. Okay.
Yes. So I'm Alex again, I, and I am presenting an update on the young model for net event notifications. So for to give you a bit of context, uh, Yam push was based on the implementation of uh, netconf event notifications. The orange header uh, was defined within an XML uh, schema within RFC 5277, and then uh, the Yam push header was wrapped within this notification. Yam push also allows you to encode the Yam push notification message in other encodings than XML. So when we are using Yang JSON or Yang Cyborg, we are not able to validate the message since the, this schema is defined in XML only. So that that's uh, what this draft tries to solve. So what we propose within this draft is only solving this gap. So it is a very, very short uh, draft defining the structure of the notification within a Yang module. Um, it updates RFC 5277 and uses the same URIs as uh, NetConf event notifications. Also, um, the event time is camel case because on the XML definition, it is camel case. So the whole um, definition of this uh, YAM module is uh, in the draft and it's very short. Current status, we have had some editorial changes based on uh, the feedback from Andy and Tom uh, from the mailing list. We have extended the abstract explaining which issues we are trying to solve. We have fixed the references and explain also why uh, the young URI and the, is the same as the XML URI defined in another draft. Um, the, there, are, there has been a bunch of questions about uh, how the, this draft and the NetConf notification messages are uh, in linked, are, um, uh, are common. So we have added a section explaining the difference uh, for that. And then at the end, we have added some examples of how a JSON encoded message uh, should look like and the Cibor encoded message. So um, current issues, uh, long time ago, I have had the feedback that the prefix was not right for this young module. I have no problem in changing uh, this uh, prefix. And also Andy raised that uh, this draft should request a Cibor seat. Um, I am currently discussing with the core working group for that, how it should be managed. So uh, I am suggesting to uh, to wait for the CWRC to be RFC and let's see how all these discussions with the co-working group uh, goes. So um, what's next? So uh, to, uh, to summary, uh, this draft is a very short draft, very simple one, uh, but also very crucial uh, to validate the young push notification header. It is something uh, that is uh, used, for example, in the Young uh, to Kafka project to validate the whole thing based on the different Young dependencies. So in my opinion, it's a very important one. Um, so we would like to request more feedback uh, from the working group and maybe a working group adoption if uh, there is an actual interest on that. So, uh, I'll go first and with more like the chair hat on. I believe you had a slide which is comparing that kind of uh, yes. messages. Right. So first thing that kind of jumps out for me is that's a work group document and has a definition for message time, what they call message time. So we have a duplicate definition in a work group document. Yes. And understand that you want that for your purposes, but we can have two documents trying to define the same thing. Mm -hmm. So have you talked to the authors of notification messages to see either work with them okay. to, to move that draft if that works for you? It's giving other um, data nodes also, but it gives you at least the, what you want from an event time perspective. 
but could you, for example, if that progresses, could that be used by you also? Um, so the thing is that they define a whole new structure to bundle the uh, multiple notifications within the same uh, YAM push notification. And uh, in my YAM module, I am defining only the gap, right? So in my opinion, both YAM modules uh, solve uh, well, they, they are actually um, focused on implementing new features. So getting a bunch of notifications within the same. And uh, the young module uh, um, expects to only fill the gap on RFC 5277. So I, what I would expect is that the second draft um, depends on uh, the young module I defined. So. Hi, Alex. I just wanted to do, um, you had a slide on CBOS seed allocation, I think. Um, so just the status of that document, uh, it's, it's, in IT, it's in ISG review at the moment, and there's a couple of discuss blocking that document. But that was discussed this week, and I think those are going to clear, because we now have a path forward. So my expectation is that should then exit ISG review. Speak in the microphone, please. Oh, I thought I was, and now I am. Um, sorry. So the... Uh, I was saying the CBOS SID draft, I think that's now clearing ISG review. And so um, I think the issues have been resolved. So hence, it then progress. And hence, I think it's probably is worth getting a CBOS SID range allocated and maybe generating a SID file for this. Um, fair enough. I, I've discussed with the working group chairs uh, to see uh, what they were focusing on and also to see if they were having guidelines for these allocations, they have not. Um, so I would expect that, uh, what, what I want uh, with the CBOR seat allocation is that, okay, I'm okay implementing them within the draft, but then uh, I would like to have guidelines for next people implementing YAM push to also allocate them. Right, because otherwise I would only have the YAM push header with the CBOR seat and the rest with, with the, CBOR, the normal CBOR. So for me, having only this draft is useless, but there, we need some guidelines on how should notifications be defined and how these CBOR seats should be uh, allocated. So, the, so that's my only uh, okay. concern, basically. So the CBOS SID draft, it should have a uh, document effectively how you allocate SIDs for existing RFC. So one RFCs that would have YAM modules published, then there's a plan for generating SID files for those. So that would solve that problem. The one interesting thing for this, though, is uh, SIDs obviously are more efficient if you can compress and allocate the IDs close together. This might be a case where you want to try and tweak things so that the the numbers you're using for the parent Yang push structure and this one are quite closely aligned. Um, because maybe... as far as far as I understood is that what you would have within the whole network is uh, you either encode the message in CBOR, in normal CBOR or in CBOR seed. So to actually use the CBOR seed, you would need the allocation of this seed range for all the Yang uh, dependent, yes. Uh, yes. exactly. So that's something I would like. Uh, I don't mind doing it, but then I would like the working group to push other people also to uh, allocate these seats, right? You, you you may not need to. Just by doing it in your draft, maybe the, the forcing function is required to get the other ones allocated. If they don't have ah, you mean the, the automatic allocation from... Yeah, so, yeah. There's, okay. so there's been two discussions on that. One is whether when you publish an RFC that has a SID file, that if, the, if it depends on other Yang models that don't have SID files, they'll get generated automatically. I was pushing for them to actually just generate the SID files for every published RFC, yeah, uh, exactly. not every published RFC with a Yang model. And so it solves it either way, but I don't think you need to worry about it here. Okay. Okay, I'm next. Uh, Kent, I think with all hats on, I just want to thank you for this contribution. I, I, I really appreciate it when people uh, bring uh, drafts to the ITF that are trying to fill gaps that, you know, this is like something that hasn't been defined for how many years. So thank you. 
uh, Thomas Graf Swisscom. So speaking for a network operator and looking at the current industry, uh, we have basically all the major vendors have uh, been implementing propriety and push solutions. So uh, we are aware of many implementations, implementations which are coming up and therefore in this context, uh, um, uh, as a, as a co-author, I think it's important that we are progressing with this draft very quickly because it's a gap currently within uh, Yang Push and if we can resolve that quickly, that would lead to uh, a quick adoption in the industry. Thanks. So as a chair, I would like to fast track this adoption as well. So we'll discuss this. Right. Thank you. There's one more, um, Ahmed. Uh, right. Uh, yep, yeah, I'm here. Uh, Ahmed Swisscom. So uh, just a question to the authors here. Uh, the whole premise of this draft is to provide a Yang description that you could use to validate the messages that are coming from the routers, right? Um, I'm wondering first how why you use structs to describe this, and second, how you does the existing tooling provide this validation, or we have to validate it with a new tooling? On top of this, I haven't heard the the, the first question uh, uh, about the second question. So far, there is no tooling for that. Mm -hmm. We are trying to use uh, Yankit. Yankit, uh, they have implemented the support for this header. Mm -hmm. um, and the first question was uh, why use structs structures for it? Ah. Um, because uh, the notification in Yang is defined as a statement, uh, as a keyword. And therefore, you cannot define it as a simple container. Okay. So basically, when you define, for example, in uh, Yang push, the push update notification is defined as a type. And this type, the notification type, is not defined. That's the issue. So uh, here, since from what I implied from your answer to my second question that there is special requirements to use this draft to validate. I would like to see this because the standard tooling would not work. So there must be some implementation section to tell you how you would validate the messages using the same, uh, using the structure that you provided. Uh, right. Because it deviates from the standard Yank at this point. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, so Kent, as a contributor, uh, I have software that validates SS structures. And what I do is I just quickly rewrite the Yang module to be instead of a structure, it's a container. And then I validate it that way. <laughs> it's a cheat, but it works with all the standard tools. Yeah, but I mean, we have to document this somehow. I mean, it's a hack that you came with, so, right? Mm -hmm. Next, we'll do the next presentation. Um, so here I, I am presenting the, a new draft about uh, generic young groupings for UDP clients and UDP servers. So the context it was from the last AETF that I got uh, some feedback about uh, these definitions within, with, within the UDP notice draft and that there were some interest on having them in a dedicated draft. So, so far the scope of this draft is having uh, generic groupings for UDP clients and servers and also including the DTLS uh, implementation. So this, uh, is to be used as standalone or uh, with in combination with other protocol stacks, such as, uh, for example, the UDP native one. Um, no surprises. So for the client, uh, they were already implemented in UDP native draft. So I've only extracted those and put it in, uh, in a new draft. Um, the IP address is defined as IP address no zone. Uh, from the feedback on uh, UDP native. Uh, the DTLS container, I am using the ITF TLS client uh, generic grouping uh, to implement it. 
And since uh, we are focusing on the TLS 1.3, we have removed uh, from the uh, um, we have removed the DTLS 1.2 uh, bits from the young module, and also uh, the feature statement uh, of DTLS so is also defined within uh, this uh, young module. Same for the server, but instead of uh, using the, the client ones, I am using the server ones. And so, yeah, um, I would like to request more feedback or more contributions to this work. Uh, I understood that it could be interesting for the quick working group, so I will send out uh, an email to them uh, so, so that they are aware of this work. And uh, as I stated before, since it becomes a dependency for UDP Notif, uh, I would like to request uh, working group adoption. Okay, so uh, I'll go first, Kenton McHugh as a contributor and also a co-author, I believe. Um, but I, and I mentioned this once before, uh, I think this draft maybe only needs to define the UDP client and UDP server groupings and not do the DTLS extensions. Okay. The reason why is because those extensions are currently using the TLS uh, groupings from the TLS client server drafts. And, and therefore, um, they don't need to be redefined in this draft. The, a, any consumer who wishes to define a DTLS stack can uh, use the UDP like client grouping and also the TLS client grouping and compose the equivalent stack themselves. Okay, so, I so see this your, draft your can point. be dramatically okay. simpler. You don't actually have to have the okay. DTLS client or the DTLS server parts in it. Okay. And just leverage all of that from the existing TLS client server drafts. Okay, um, I implemented those because uh, from an email from from my age, you you were interested in in those, so I. Um, just to, I mean, I I probably must have suggested it because I thought it uh, it's just one grouping that needs to be included in or used inside. Right, but in all the uh, other client server drafts, the stack of them, um, it's always the case that they need to be used as well but they don't redefine them themselves. They, they just simply refer or use the grouping that's being defined in the other drafts, so. Okay, then, uh, yeah, if the working group is okay, I will remove them from, from the draft. Okay. That makes, and that makes this draft even smaller and quicker to get through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Thomas Graf from Swisscom. Um, maybe can you go to the slide where you showed, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Mahesh was already uh, raising that basically by moving now that information to another draft document, we are creating a dependency. And as I said before, uh, the industry is moving forward. We, we are looking very forward to the adoption of Yang Push, and that's yet another uh, puzzle piece uh, which is needed. So therefore, and if I recall also correctly from uh, Rob's comment in previous that uh, we would welcome that this is being also fast tracked as well. Yeah. Okay. In Benoit Claire, so there's always a noble goal to have groupings, right? So uh, if I look at the history of what we're trying to do with a series of drafts, HTTP and TLS and client server, I looked up the timeline there. So, okay, I won't, I won't mention here, but my point is that since there are dependencies, is there a way that we could say in this working group, if it didn't go through within a year or something like that, or whatever X meeting, then we go without the grouping because of dependencies. Because my fear is that, I mean, I witnessed the experience of the series of draft that you have, Kent, right? Client, server, HTTP, TLS. It was many, many years, right? So can we just say, maybe with the AD there, if not done within that time frame, we forget about that because we need those dependencies now. Well, I mean, in terms of, uh, I think the chairs are in agreement that since this is a dependency to an existing working group document that we need to progress this to become a working group document as quickly as possible. So we would also fast track this. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, who do this? Okay. Um, so, uh, my name is Joy Lin, and I'm from Ecole Polytechnique, and I'm presenting the project Yampush Integration into Apache Kafka today, which is the internship project I've done uh, in Huawei Island Research Center. And I work on the Libyan push parts that handle the YAM push messages and uh, Yando, uh, YAM model registration to schema registry. And next slide, please. And today I'm bringing an introduction to the value of this project and the issues that we wish to uh, discuss along with the solution we have chosen in the library. And we, wish, uh, we propose a draft to solve one of the issues. Next slide, please. Uh, nowadays, when we talk about network management, we're talking about the three steps of issue detection, identification, and corrections. And with the demand of bringing this process into automation being greater, uh, uh, a great a basis for this is the reliable telemetric data, which guarantee that the issue detection results is complete and accurate. And in terms of the completeness, we need the metrics from three planes, management plane, data plane, and op operational plane. And in this project, we use the YAM push method to collect the operational metrics, which is the YAM data. And in terms of the data collect correctness, we need to make sure that the metrics collected using this method will be clear instead of being misleading. And next slide, please. I think you can uh, progress the slides yourself now. Sorry? Uh, are you able to use the arrow keys to progress the slides yourself now? I'm not sure. Let me check. Oh, okay. So I see you're asking to share screen. I'll just, I'll do it. I'm sorry. I did pass the slide control oh. to you, but it didn't work, I guess. Okay. So next slide, please. And in the classical network telemetry framework we're using to date, it's not possible to directly apply the YAM push method into this framework because of missing semantics due to the fact that the YAM model that the metrics are collected from is never communicated from the router to the operator database. And uh, next slide, please. We are proposing the data uh, data mesh systems, which introduce a schema registry in between the router and the operator database in order to keep record of the YAM model of each data we received so that the problem of missing semantics can be solved. And to implement that, a YAM push receiver is needed between the schema registry and the data collector PMACCT to clarify which YAM model is used by the data and to get it from the router by sending a get schema request and register it in schema registry. And that's the job of the library lib YAM push. Next slide, please. And this is an overview of the Libyan push and current states for the library. Uh, it has been an open source library in GitHub. And as for the schema registries, uh, there is uh, there is uh, working uh, an example of the uh, pluggable schema registry, but it's not open source yet. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next one. Thank you. And um, we have found the following issues when implementing this library, which includes how to store the YAM models in schema registry and how to know the YAM model of each, each, each data and how to obtain the YAM model in its dependencies. Next slide, please. And in terms of the first problems, uh, uh, we need to, um, uh, how to store the YAM models in schema registry. First of all, we need to make sure that it can simulate the YAM data structure uh, with the following sense. Uh, the schema contents can correspond to the YAM source code and the schema reference correspond to the YAM model dependencies relationship. And of course, it needs to add the functionality of YAM validations. And next slide, please. As for the second problem, uh, how to know the subscribe module, there are two ways that we can do it um, according to our research. 
uh, for, the first solution is to pass the namespaces in the first YAM push messages we uh, we we received because the module names is always uh, recorded as the prefix in the data store content. And this solution also facilitates us to find the augmentations uh, reverse dependence, which is a reverse dependency because its modeling is uh, also in the value as a prefix. And the second solution is to use the ITF Yang subscribe notification uh, model to get the subscription information uh, by sending a get request to that model and pass the data store expat filter or the subtree filter. And then we can find the subscribe path. And pass, by passing that path, we can know the subscribe model. And in the library, we have chose the solution to next slide, please. In terms of the last problem, how to obtain the YAM model and its dependencies. And since here, we're not when we talk about obtaining the module, we're not only talking about sending a single get schema request to the router, because we also need to register all of its dependencies, which could be a lot. And uh, therefore, uh, one single get schema request is not enough. And here we propose on-demand downloading and get all schema. The first solution, in terms of the first solution, we do uh, we we know the direct dependency imports and includes by directly passing the young source codes uh, to get them. And in terms of the reverse dependencies, we send a get request to the ITF young library young model uh, to uh, to get the deviation list and the augmentation list. But since the augmentation list is not there yet, uh, so we uh, did not follow with this solution. Uh, instead, we choose the get all schema, uh, which is to get all the schemas from the router at the connection beginning, at, at the connection establishment, and store them in disk. In that way, we manipulate the entire YAM model and so that we know all of the relationship of each YAM model. And we have chose to use the get all schema in the library. Next slide, please. And we have designed a DFS algorithm for uh, finding all of the dependency of one model by tr uh, which will traverse the entire YAM tree. Next slide, please. And here is an usage example of the uh, solution we have chosen. And this has been presented before uh, in the last IETF um, meeting. Uh, next slide, please. Next one, please. And in the end, we would like to propose to, uh, to augment the ITF YAM library, YAM model, uh, to also provide the augmentation list in the sense that uh, if the, the, the solution get all schema is uh, does not work in the long run because it does not facilitate usage with real device uh, because there are a lot more uh, YAM models in there and downloading all of them will take a long time. And in that case, the on-demand downloading will be more applicable, but only if that the deviation list and the augmentation list are both provided in the ITF YAM library. So it is reasonable to also have the augmentation list and the draft has already been posted. Next slide, please. The link for Libyan push, uh, Libyan push is uh, posted in the last slide and it's already open source. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Any comments, questions? Right. Rob has entered the queue. Uh, Rob Walton as, as a contributor. So, one concern I have with adding the augmentation list into Yang libraries effectively almost gives you like a duplicate of information. So there's information that's already um, specified in the Yang modules and you're now also providing that same information in a different mechanism. And so there is a risk there whenever you provide the same information in two different ways that it becomes out of sync and you have to then trust which you're going to use. I guess the answer is that you'd always rely on what's in the Yang models as being correct. Um, so that's one potential downside of doing this. That's fair. Benoit Clay, so I think it's not different than the deviation, right, that you've got in the Yang libraries. The thing here is actually a timing issue. If you want to use Yang push 
and we're going to receive exactly, if I make a comparison with IPFIX, we're going to receive Yang push, UDP-based, from multiple routers all the time. The question is, do we want to lose the time to get the get-all schema, which could take a long time, from every single new device that we have, or device type, or device with iOS, or device with a specific line card set? So this is the issue here. It's real-time timing of telemetry. And somehow, this is small cost to get it directly with a request into the Yang library. Uh, Robertson, yes. Uh, so I acknowledge that deviations also have the same thing. So but I think in Yang packages, we deliberately took deviations out to remove that sort of duplication. So we're going the other direction with Yang packages. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Rob that this information is already available elsewhere, so I'm not seeing that this whole thing depends on this, but I don't think it hurts too much either to have this in there. If it simplifies for some clients to have it in there already pre-computed, that's kind of nice. As long as it's not um, become too large or, I mean, I don't think it's complicating things too much. All right, and as long as you're standing up, you're the last presenter. Thank you. So the, <clears throat> the previous presentation is a very great uh, introduction to what I'm about to talk about here. It's pretty much uh, the same area. Thank you. So we, we have also been working with uh, telemetry and time series databases a bit. This is supposed to be a checkbox. Uh, I mean, you have, already, you have already seen probably a lot of these graphs uh, coming out of your networks and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, we have a line here now showing whatever it is that we want to be showing uh, when it comes to telemetry. Uh, and much of this telemetry generation is called based on Yang-capable systems, so we are taking Yang functionality and bringing it out in graphs like this. But my point is that, in, at least in, in certain cases, uh, we are cer certainly getting really nice graphs. But in many cases, we don't really know what we are measuring. I'm a, uh, as many of you know, I'm a climate buff. So I want to do uh, read uh, about energy consumption and also all the, those sort of things. And uh, when I look, as we see many graphs that is showing how much CO2 or energy or something like that is being used in my network. But as soon as I ask, all oh, right, so is the cooling cost included in this number here? Um, the guy that's showing me this graph is uh, uh, John D. And usually you don't get an answer because this is hidden somewhere. You don't know what we are measuring really. When you get up to this level on the collection aggregation, we have lost track of what it is that we are really aggregating and measuring. Uh, so we are lacking uh, traceability. We can't see what we are measuring. We don't know if, even what unit is it, if there's any sort of precision guarantees about this. So if this is, if this is, uh, if the important thing is to show a graph and make somebody impressed, we are already there, yes. But if we are to make decisions based on this, should we move the traffic to, from data center A to data center B, is that a good idea? Will I save something on doing that? Then we need to be um, pretty sure about the data. We need to know where it's coming from and it's dependable. And I don't think we are there quite yet. So uh, I'm proposing, uh, uh, I've just posted a draft called this the Philatelist framework because Philatelists are all about collecting the timestamps uh, timestamp data. So there's a very similar to what you just saw in the previous presentation. You have collectors, you have providers, uh, aggregators that are bringing this whole, and I'm not really going to focus on that in this presentation right now. But just to give you an idea, the thing is that we are collecting things from both Yang capable devices, as well as something that's totally have never heard about Yang, like from redfish sources about CPU temperatures and I know what else that has no Yang modules today. But we are making sure that it's landing, all this data is landing in a time series database and that every data that's in the database here has a Yang description associated with it. And along with metadata, like the precision, the units and is cooling included or not, all of these things should be metadata associated with this data. Uh, and then we are providing it, uh, aggregating this data from multiple such sources with time series uh, data into yet other time series data because you are aggregating this, taking all of these and adding the cooling stuff and getting this into a time series database like here. But one of the things that I think is particularly relevant to this room and this group is 
OK, so we have data that's on the left side that's all described in Yang. And we have data in here that's in a time series database format. How do we make that leap? Well, we need a way of finding out what do we call the object in the time series database so we know which Yang leaves they come from. So that's why we have this uh, Christian Larsen. I'm um, presenting this on behalf of Christian. Uh, who has made a, a proposal on how you take Yang paths and uh, including the keys and all these things and map them into the sort of tagged format the time series databases use. So we have this uh, rendering style. We have a, you start with a model and you get everything falling out of the model. You don't have to have any assumptions or special. You, you can, we are implementing this particular model. But you have the model driven infrastructure for time series databases as well. And this is what it looks like. Basically, we're replacing the slashes with underscores, taking out of the keys and setting them as labels because that's how the time series databases work. They have these readings and a lot of labels to say, okay, so which server or which interface or which whatever was this about. We think it is very important that uh, all the data that's in the, in the time series database is described by Yang because the Yang is providing a lot of the information and context and there's no, it's not possible for us to go out to every device in the world and say that you have to uh, implement our special kind of uh, power measurement Yang model. It's gonna take 10 years, we don't have the 10 years. So we have to be able to work with whatever else out there, but then augment with uh, metadata and descriptions of, of this in Yang. And uh, since, uh, since we're doing this uh, mapping, we don't call it, uh, it's, it, I mean, we have uh, Yang to XML, and we have Yang to JSON, uh, or encodings really, but this is not an encoding because this is not doing everything possible that you can do in Yang into time switch databases. We're only focusing on the use cases where you want to use a time switch database. So we call it the mapping. We are taking, explaining how you take a Yang model and translating that into the time switch database things uh, for the part of Yang that, that makes sense there. And uh, based on this, you can get uh, queries uh, in, in the typical time series databases like this, uh, where you use these names that are coming from the Yang models directly. So that's, that's how we propose that we work with time series data based on Yang. Thank you. Any comments? Yes, uh, Thomas Graf, Swisscom. Ah, it's amazing because what you're just describing and looking through your draft is basically what probably currently a network operator does when consuming the young messages from the network and what uh, processing steps are needed to actually make it work end to end. Uh, uh, I have a few comments, like uh, first, uh, like on slide five, you write uh, on the transport on the transport format, just one clause would be nice to have there, something which is pre uh, preserving semantics because today we are losing semantics already uh, in, in the transport and basically uh, render the, 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 let's say, preserving uh, the, the information uh, makes it difficult. And then uh, on section 3.2 in your uh, <laughs> um, draft document, uh, you nicely describe basically how the, 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 the subscription needs to be maintained on the, on the network nodes and how it need, needs to be managed. Here maybe one additional thought is um, uh, I'm into like the data mesh architecture where basically data products needs to be managed. So uh, data products have like SLIs and SLOs. So we need to have quality in our metrics. So we need to understand whenever we are subscribing on something that actually we are also getting the data and we are not losing data because we are in the business of real-time streaming data. So that could be maybe an interesting addition in, in there. Or uh, in the uh, section 3.3 where you talk about process and aggregator components, you're using the terms streams and flows. Yeah. yeah. Um. We can call them other things. I just um, invented those uh, terms but, in the context of this document. But, but what's really nice is actually uh, 
there are terminologies basically like in for instance in kafka we call them topics and subjects so basically how you channel and basically do the, the semantics and then last one not least if you go into the outlook what could be very interesting is basically uh the uh right now you're describing basically when you flatten the data when you uh do the json explosion uh you need to change the, the dimension names in the time series database right so we are in contact with uh, time series database vendors and saying hey at the end what we want is actually support of yang in a time series database and i think what would really the industry benefit is that we're setting some requirements and saying if a time series database would, would need to support yang uh, these are the requirements we have to support that and until that this is what the network operator needs to do to make it end-to-end -end work very good i mean the reason we i wrote this draft was to make this conversation happen and i'm very happy exactly. that you're bringing this up and the, uh, uh, the, the work with this draft is never giving me uh, uh, such a strong imposter syndrome as anything before uh, I know that uh, some people in this room have worked uh, a decade about with professionally with this uh, sort of tele telemetry collection for every week that I have spent on this. So it's uh, it's very intimidating to stand here and propose how things should be done. But I, I agree, it's, it's very nice to be uh, to get feedback like this. And we will I very much like to cooperate around this. Absolutely, thanks a lot. Go ahead, Emmett. All right, uh, so Ahmed from Swisscom, I would like to add my voice to Thomas and say this is very important because at this point, most operators are hacking their way around to get the Yang data into, um, into time series databases. Uh, two notes, uh, one that Thomas elaborated to is one, it's important always to keep the semantics. I see that uh, there is a mapping here, but we need to be very aware that we don't lose semantics. It's not about drawing graphs. It's about actually providing insights at the end of the day. Uh, the second thing I see the draft is taking the approach of mapping Yang to existing time series databases. And I would like to see a more two-way conversation to have a bit more ideal solution than just mapping to what is exists there. So let's try to think about what kind of requirements we need from the time series databases and what kind of uh, things that we can reach a way that is, let's say, best for both worlds, not just mapping what we have to some time series databases. And as Thomas said, we have seen a lot of interest from time series databases vendors to actually adopt Yang because they see a lot of potential there. So uh, let's, let's make a two-way conversation rather than just mapping our stuff to their stuff. If you can help us with that conversations, uh, those conversations, nobody will be more happy than I'm. Definitely. <laughs> well, it's great to see all the interest in this work. Thank you. OK, so I think that completes the list of uh, scheduled presentations. As I uh, mentioned in the beginning of the session, uh, Per was hoping to uh, maybe have a discussion about uh, NetConf Next and RESTConf Next. Did you want to? Yeah. I can try. So there's uh, on uh, the NetConf um, working group, uh, there's two projects, uh, two repositories, one called RESTConf Next and one called NetConf Next. And there's about uh, 10 to uh, 20 issues on each of them. And uh, since we uh, have loads of time left in the NetConf working group, I thought uh, now when every, all the work is uh, becoming finalized, we can take on that work package. Um, so maybe if you can uh, share the um, screen. Also. So uh, what do you, uh, so let me so, just quickly interject them. So what is the objective? Yes, yeah, so the objective would be to uh, maybe, uh, if people are interested, uh, to uh, do a, a side meeting and uh, start looking at uh, what could be done now without, a new, without new versions of the protocol, uh, what uh, needs a new uh, protocol version, what is interesting, what is uninteresting. I mean, it, it's not uh, that many issues, so 
it should be possible to do um, what requires, for instance, Young Next, etc. Uh, so if, if people are interested, just a quick show of hands. Do people that are not interested raise your hand? <laughs> Great. No one is not interested. <laughs> so everyone stays here afterwards and we'll schedule a side meeting. Um, no, but if, uh, for real, if, is anyone interested in uh, spinning or uh, fixing stuff with NetConf and REST Conf? Yeah. yeah. So a um, quarter of the room or yeah. some such. So um, uh, then uh, just over here afterwards and we'll uh, try to schedule either a side meeting or just some uh, ad hoc meeting in the corridor. Yeah, I would suggest that uh, you set up a side meeting and send the information out on the mailing list saying when and where to meet. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I am presenting uh, the NetConf next issues. Uh, currently, uh, there's uh, 22 issues. And then uh, I also have RESTConf, I think, to, to, to switch up. Yeah, 12 issues in RESTConf. So these are relatively small number of issues. Uh, I mean, there's over, uh, I think, 100 issues for Yang Next. So comparatively less effort. OK, well, we finished early. <laughs> Thank you. And did you want to yeah. say more? Um, Thanks for coming. That pretty much concludes the session. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Press this button to. Oh no, it doesn't work. I don't know what that does. But, oh, maybe it's I like. Think it's like